Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk this morning. Um, I'm going to be talking about the effects of upwelling on larval alewife recruitment. So, a little bit about me. I am a rising senior at Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida, majoring in marine science and environmental studies. So over here is where St. Petersburg is, and this is my campus. So right on the water, and it's very beautiful there. And here is my dog. He's very old right now. He's 18, going on 19. So he's pretty legal. <laughs> and some acknowledgments. I would like to thank my project mentors, Maddie Tomzak and Ed Rutherford, for helping me out this summer, as, long as, um, as well as the crew of the Laurentian and other people listed here. I've had a great summer, and I'm excited to share my research. So a little bit of background about alewife. These um, fish are a migratory freshwater species in the Great Lakes, and they usually migrate inshore and into tributaries to spawn. They are the basis of the Salmonid fisheries, and they support a multi-billion dollar recreational fishery. Though there has been a slow decline in the population since the 1970s due to salmon predation. So in this figure over here is the lake-wide biomass of alewife, and on the x-axis is the year, and y-axis is the weight um, in millions of kilograms. So since the introduction of salmonids, the biomass of alewife has greatly decreased. And since the invasion of the zebra and quagga mussels, this number is reaching an all-time low currently. So these um, larvae hatch out around 3.5 to 5 millimeters in size, so they are not very strong swimmers. They um, depend on water currents in their early life to transport them around the lake. And this greatly influences their recruitment, and the recruitment is the process of adding new adults into the population. So um, my study is looking at upwellings. So upwellings um, occur when strong winds blow over a body of water, and then that warm water is displaced and new colder water um, rises and replaces that water. So um, upwellings are beneficial in the ocean because they bring nutrients up and increase primary productivity, but they are not so beneficial in the lake ecosystem because a lot of the larval fish spawn um, and they prefer warmer waters and upwellings can kind of move them to non-favorable habitats in colder, deeper waters where there's not much zooplankton around to eat. So upwellings can greatly affect their recruitment into, up, into adulthood. So here are the wind-driven nearshore circulations in Lake Michigan. So we have the anticyclonic and cyclonic currents, and these currents kind of keep the larvae near shore in the warmer waters where there's higher primary productivity. So a little bit more background about alewives and how they came to Lake Michigan. They are um, a saltwater species that is native to the Atlantic coast, but invaded through the canals that we built. They then became very abundant in biomass and are detrimental to the lake because they consume early pelagic life stages of other native species and also compete for zooplankton with other native species. And this has caused huge die-offs because these fish are very sensitive to big fluctuations in temperature. So in the 1960s, we decided to introduce salmonids to try to control the alewife population. And that has um, been very good, as you've seen in the graph earlier, where the populations have decreased. But alewife are the primary food source for these salmonids. And when there are no alewife, there is a collapse in the salmon fishery. So in 2003, the alewife population collapsed in Lake Huron, and that has led to a decreased um, population of salmonids. So right now, we're trying to study what affects alewife recruitment. And from what we've seen in the past, there are three main modes of mortality for alewife. There is predation, starvation, and now upwellings. So my research objective is to address the recruitment bottlenecks, primarily uh, upwellings for larval alewife distribution and survival, and then try to predict the larvae using forecasts of a validated um, current model. So our hypothesis is that smaller alewife 
hatched in early June will be more vulnerable to these advections and upwellings by strong currents and experience a higher mortality compared to larvae hatched in July. So some of the methods are, so we would go out to Muskegon on the west side of Lake Michigan in this figure over here and do ichthyoplankton toes. So we had two types of nets that we used to tow. We had the bongo nets and the nusan nets. The nusan nets is used to tow at the surface of the water column and bongo is towed throughout. And then later these samples are preserved in ethanol. And we also took, I have this little video of a uh, time lapse of us on the boat. We also took um, additional data collection, such as zooplankton, CTD, plankton um, survey system, which is the PSS, acoustics, eDNA. So very interdisciplinary and lots of things going on at the same time. So we also used, um, a model to try to track the patch of larvae that we caught. So we, um, once we found larvae on that first day, we set out a pair of drifters to try to track the surface movement of water to see if the larvae were over where the drifters ended up. And we also used a hydrodynamic model and particle dispersion model based off of Mark's row model um, to try to follow the patch of larvae. So we went to three different sites called the centroid, which is this lighter area over here where there's the highest probability of particle density. And we also went to sites um, that are 10% probability and outside the model blob. So we followed these larvae around every day um, based on the sites and sampled um, everything. So back in the lab, we processed the samples by picking through the jars and trying to find these little tiny larvae um, fish. And then we later identified them and measured their total lengths. We also extracted their otoliths and otoliths are ear stones that fish produce made of calcium, calcium carbonate structures and these are used to age fish. So during the larval stage of the fish, they put on daily rings and these rings can be used to age the fish and find their hatch date. So this is an otolith photo right here. And as you can see that there's little rings on them that we can count and age when they've hatched, similar to like aging a tree, which is kind of cool. So getting to the results, here is the June alewife density compared to um, two other different years. So we have 2010, 2015, and 2023. And on the y-axis, we have the mean density, um, the number of larvae per 1,000 meters cubed. So we can see that in um, during the June cruise, we did not catch a lot of alewife. And this can be due to um, temperature changes. So there was a major upwelling that occurred that I will show later in late June. So that could have kind of shifted the numbers a lot because we could not get out um, onto the lake due to weather conditions. But we can see that in 2015, there was a large density of alewife. But in the July cruise, we found a lot of alewife. So we don't know if these are the ones that survived the upwelling and are coming back and that we found them, or if they're newly hatched um, larvae. But as you can see in 2015, there were two major upwellings and the density of alewife decreased a lot. So this, um, we, so I went, we went to the three sites I described earlier, which were centroid, um, 0.1 probability and outside the blob. And these are the mean alewife densities at each site. So as you can see, as we kind of moved out of the model sites, we caught a higher number of larvae, which doesn't really correspond with what the model is saying. But there are some limitations to um, the numbers that we see in the model. And that can be due to that on the first day of the cruise, we kind of just set out to different sites to try to find a patch of larvae. And if we did catch some larvae, we set out the drifters and we told Mark to run the model based off of that. But if we caught a smaller patch, it might have been harder to try to predict where the larvae were going to go and there were smaller densities. Additionally, we only sampled one small area of the model, and this model is has a large area, um, many kilometers wide. So it, um, the, the larvae could be in that blob, but since we did not catch them there, 
um, th they could be in that blob, but we are not measuring the whole area. So that could also be why, um, be why we did not catch a lot of fish. Also, um, the currents in Lake Michigan are highly variable, so that can be difficult to try to predict where this patch is moving. So here is a Lake um, Michigan temperature profile. In the red is the surface temperature, and in the Y is the bottom temperature. So these are the two dates that we went out on the cruise, so one in late June and one in late July, early August. The 15 degree mark kind of displays that um, adult alewife tend to spawn in warmer temperatures. So we can see that there's a little window right here where the alewives are spawning. And then the 10 degrees kind of indicates um, the temperature where the larvae are shocked and kind of face high mortality rates based on the low temperatures. And right here is a little animation of the upwelling that occurred in late June this year. So as you can see, the temperatures were very warm on the coast. But in a few days, um, an upwelling occurred, and then all the warm water got replaced by cold water, which is not favorable for these larvae. So um, based off of measuring the total lengths of the alewife, we can kind of create a plot of um, looking at the total length and the frequency of alewife. So on the x-axis, we have the total length and why we have the frequency of alewife. The red indicates the cruise one, so the cruise at late June, early July, and cruise two was in late July, early August. So there was a larger distribution of alewife in um, the second cruise compared to the first cruise. And as you can see, we did catch some larger fish on the second cruise, so maybe those are the alewife that survived the upwelling. We do not know until we look at the otoliths. So based off of the otoliths, we um, concluded that none of the alewife that were hatched in June survived the upwelling because um, over here is a plot of the capture dates in blue and then the hatch dates in um, orange. And then so on the first cruise, we see that these alewives hatched around mid-June where the water temperatures were warming up. But the sec on the second cruise, we um, took their otoliths and we aged them, and we found that all of the alewives hatched around July. So we can conclude that none of the alewives survived the upwelling, but we are not 100% sure because these alewives would have been larger by now, the ones hatched in June, and could avoid the net during the daytime since they can see the net coming for them so they can swim out of the way. And they also occupy different um, depths in the water column and we didn't really tow throughout the water column as much, so that could be another factor to why we did not see larger alewives. So relating the upwellings and year class strength, over here is a plot of um, year class strengths compared to different years. So year class strength relates um, the success of larger adults into the population. So a number above zero means that the population is doing well, while um, a number under zero means the population did not do well. So in 2010, when the relative temperatures were a lot warmer and stayed hot with no major upwellings, we saw that the year class strength increased um, or the year class strength was positive. Meanwhile, in 2015, there were two major upwelling events in early, late July, early and late July, and that led to a lower year class strength. And then the USGS goes out every year to collect this data and then kind of relate it back three years to see how that year class is doing. So our hypothesis earlier mentioned was that smaller alewife hatched in early June would be more vulnerable. And I would say that our findings this year did support that. Um, additionally, in the 2015 alewife densities, we saw that the alewife density was very high in June, but very low in July. So maybe that was um, because of the upwelling. And some future, future work is looking at the year class strength in 2026, in three years, to see if what the recruitment success is like um, for the 2023 alewife population. Also looking at the impacts of upwellings on the growth of alewives 
and then looking at how the date and strength of upwelling may impact the population in the long run. Since upwellings might become more frequent due to climate change and stronger, so trying to see if there's a correlation between the strength or the date of upwellings. And then trying to do more model validation by getting more samples, going to more sites, and more replicates. Thank you. Wonderful job, Heather. Uh, questions for Heather? Yes, Lindsay. Hey, Heather, great job. Um, it's clear you did a ton of work on that. Um, my question is, are upwellings typical only in June or can they happen in July as well? Mm -hmm. um, and then, so that's the first question. And then the second part of that would be, therefore, if you have these upwellings in June and the those larvae don't do well, but then you get the July spawn that does well, does that mean that the alewife fishery is the year class strength will be okay. Mm -hmm. So basically, yeah, do you only get them in the upwelling in June? And can you kind of buffer the um, recruitment by having a good July uh, spawning? Yeah. So upwellings are more common in the summer months. So they can occur in June and July when there is that stratification of water. Um, so I think that larvae hatched mid June, kind of, it depends on when the um, temperature of the lake. So if it's a warmer spring, these alewives will hatch earlier, or if it's a colder spring, that they'll hatch later. So it's very temperature dependent. Yeah. Uh, so upwelling usually occur in uh, on the west coast mm -hmm. of Lake Michigan because uh, uh, westerly dominate year long, but summertime is a uh, very uh, weaker than the winter. So westerly from the wind blowing from the west. So the upwelling here, I think, mainly due to the storm, I guess, mm -hmm. rather yeah. than due to the westerly. Westerly, and then on uh, our east coast, we should have the uh, downwelling. Yeah. So I think that strong storms can also um, produce upwellings as well. So following up on that, how would your results change in Lake Huron? Because if you're taking samples on the east coast of the lake, would the seasonal weather patterns affect recruitment in mm -hmm. the different parts of the lake? So there are... The, you may not know, but what do you think? Yeah. So the year class recruitment is based off of like all of Lake Michigan or all of the Great Lakes combined. So we uh, do not know for sure that like only the Muskegon larvae, serve, like the year class strength of the Muskegon larvae, it's, it's the alewife larvae as a whole, in a sense, or the population as a whole across all the Great Lakes. Do we have one online, Aubrey? Yep. Sorry, Dave. Oh, um, she's just curious, what did your zooplankton distribution look like? Did it follow what you saw with the larval alewife? And she's also sorry if you already explained this. Yeah. She may have just missed it. So I don't think we had time to go over the zooplankton um, densities yet, but we do have that data and are currently processing it. So it'll be interesting to see if there are any correlations with high zooplankton mass and high um, alewife density. Okay. Have, have you thought at all about the effects of climate change on these alewife fisheries? I'm wondering, like, because uh, you said they do better in the, they do better in warm weather. So mm -hmm. you would expect them to be going up somewhat and you see like a huge spike in 1998. Yeah. But at the same time, you're saying that like a warmer spring leads to potentially more, they're, they're like, they can be hurt more by these upwellings which would also be an effect of climate change. So do you have an idea of like which direction you expect them to go as the waters get warmer? 
Um, I think as the water gets warmer, they do grow a lot faster. And if they're able to eat a lot and grow and kind of develop their fins, they can kind of swim away and try to avoid the upwellings. So I think with a warmer climate, um, it's more preferable for them since they can develop faster and try to um, avoid these upwellings that occur. Okay, thank you so much, Heather. Wonderful job.